Hi everyone, my name is Ima Ramos. I'm the curator of the Medieval to Modern South Asia collections at the museum and the curator of the Tantra exhibition, which is now drawing to a close. I'd like to welcome you all to one of our final events in the Tantra public programme. This is going to be a very special panel discussion involving some of the most exciting contemporary artists exploring ideas around tantric philosophy and symbolism. From its inception to the present day, Tantra has challenged religious, cultural and political conventions and opened up new ways of seeing and changing the world. The show features works of art by each of the artists on our panel today, each one articulating a personal, radical reimagining of this rich philosophical tradition. We're proud to be virtually hosting the acclaimed artists Bhartika, Shutapa Biswas, Penny Slinger and Prafula Mohanty. The panel is moderated by Rebecca Held from the Royal College of Art, curator of Thinking Tantra at the Drawing Room Gallery in London in 2016, which explored the intersections of Tantra with contemporary art. Rebecca, over to you. There are many artists in Asia and the West who have been inspired by Tantra and Tantric energy. Some have been inspired in formal terms, adopting its shapes and symbols. Some have been driven to explore its relationship to the cosmos. Others have been drawn to it in conceptual terms, interpreting it as a radical movement capable of challenging repressive attitudes towards gender, sex and politics. Today we'll spend time with four artists who feature in the British Museum's current exhibition, Tantra, Enlightenment to Revolution. The final room in the exhibition brings together work from the 1960s and 70s, a time of countercultural movements that sought alternative ways of being, thinking and seeing, and some of which drew on tantric ideas and imagery. There are works by South Asian artists associated with neo-tantra movement who adopted tantric symbols and adapted them to speak to the visual language of global modernism. The room also features work by contemporary female artists who have used tantra as a philosophy and set of practices to harness tantric goddesses through the bodies of real women using a feminist lens. We have with us this afternoon artists who have worked and who work with tantra in distinct ways. This is particularly fortunate because there is no detailed or orthodox history of Tantra and art. What exists is predominantly spe speculative. For example, we know that artists including Kandinsky, Mondrian, Malevich and Clay looked at and knew about Upanishadic and Vedantic teachings, but it is little documented. So it is an immense privilege to be able to hear from these artists directly. Each artist has chosen some visual material to share with us we will use this as a way to open up questions about the use of and understanding in Tantra in art today. Throughout the session, I will ask questions and at the end, there'll be time for you in the audience to ask your questions. You can submit these in the chat facility as we go along. We're going to begin by spending a bit of time with Prafula Mahanti. Prafula moved to the UK in 1960 after studying architecture in Mumbai. A writer and artist, he identifies as part of the neo-tantra movement and has shown widely internationally. Rafula has made a short film, especially for this occasion. We'll watch that first and then we'll have a few questions. So if we could have the film, please. <laughs>
So, Rafula, thank you for making that composite film for us for this special occasion. I wanted to begin by asking you, how has the energy of Tantra informed your work? I am dedicating my talk to the memory of my sister who died of COVID in a care home in London on the 10th of January and to thousands of people all over the world who lost their lives. We are sending people to the moon but unable to look after people on this beautiful planet of ours by providing good housing, health care, education and a place to work and enjoy life. Life is for enjoyment. This takes me back to my village of Nanpur, a rural village in Orissa, Eastern India. When I was three years old, my grandmother took me to the village Satsali, held on a villager's veranda. My grandmother could not read or write, but was determined that her grandson should be educated. I touched the teacher's feet and prostrated myself to pay respect to him. Then he took my right hand and with a piece of thick clay chalk helped me to draw three circles on the mud floor of the nursery school held on the village of Aranda. While chanting, Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver, Moishwe the destroyer. And as I went on drawing the circles over and over again and chanting the divine names, Brahma, Vishnu, Moishwe, Brahma, Vishnu, Moishwe, Brahma, Vishnu, Moishwe. It became a meditative chant. At the age of three, I was asking the divine energy to come and enter my circle. That is pure tantra. The circle was a diagram, chakra, and holy names, chanting was mantra and I was inviting the divine energy to come and live in this space. I was saying, Brahma, please come and live in, in my circle. Vishnu, please come to this circle. Mahishwar, please come to this circle. And when I completed my studies, I'd wipe the floor and invite and ask the divine spirits to go to their places. When I wiped it, I told the Sunya, Sunya, a space with a dimension of color or sound. At the age of three, I was doing the abstract image of the divinity. And the circle got ingrained into my brain and to my system. When I opened my eyes, when I was on the village, I saw the red bindu on my mother's forehead. The circle became the sun, the moon, and the lotus which bloomed in the pond outside the village. It is a beautiful village on the bank of a river with mango groves, palm trees swaying in the breeze like dancers, paddy fields spreading to the horizon, beautiful sun rising, beautiful moon rising, and then multicolored birds who fill the village air with their beautiful song. 
this magic. It's a simple magic of creation. So I was surrounded by this magic. My mother prayed, prayed all the time and I prayed with her. We went to the village deity, a piece of stone in oval form, smeared with vermilion paste and worshipped. And the village also had Vishnu in the shape of a lingam lying flat on the ground and also Shiva, a phallic symbol of Moes, the god of creation and destruction. But the goddess of the village was more powerful than any of the gods or goddesses. They called Mangala, Durga, Kali, Chandi. So many beautiful manifest manifestations of the mother goddess. So from this environment, I went to Bombay to study architecture. The trauma of finding myself in a different place was painful. Then I came to England and to Leeds, facing the self prejudice, withdrawing into my own self to paint and draw the villa symbols of Lotus, Jagannath, the Lord of the Universe and various gods and goddesses, Ganpati, Saraswati, Lakshmi. And immediately, the character of the room changed and it gave me a space where I could feel at home. Then I realized that wherever I am, with the use of my hands, I create my own place for myself. My school was a part of the College of Art, where the teachers liked my work and liked my performance, and I worked with them, exhibited with them, and the village symbol became personal symbol, the personal symbols became a universal symbol. And I had exhibitions in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, and in London, and various parts of Great Britain. Then when I went to India to find a gallery to exhibit my work, I went to Delhi, and the gallery manager said, Profilo, your works are perfect examples of Sansra. I said, Sansra, what is it? So he explained, because they had published a book on Sansra by Ajit Mukherjee. Then when I came to my village, I found that Sansra was a way of life, and now also it's a way of life. From child's conception, to its death as a man or woman is full of rituals related to Sansra. So I was brought up in Sansra. So my life was Sansra without my realizing that it was Sansra. And then the Gallery of Modern Art in Delhi they were collecting works of Indian artists inspired by tradition and by Sansra. And they accepted me as one of them. And we had exhibitions all over the world. And then when, in 1985, there was an exhibition in Los Angeles, I told them, look, 
I'm not doing Tantra, it is new. So they found a term called Neo Tantra. New Tantra. The circles keep appearing in my paintings. Naturally. The Tantra book is ingrained into my canvas. The circle contracts, becomes a bindu, then it disappears, becomes sunya, a space without dimension. It can only be felt, not described. Then it expands, tantra, makes a bindu become a circle. The circle goes expanding and becomes the universe. And the circle also takes different forms. All other forms are in, in it. It becomes oval, it is a square, triangle, everything is there. So all the tantric forms are inside the circle. So I'm using them because the circle is in my system. I can't help it. And I don't want to do anything else. That's my life. That's my tantra. And silence is very important for me, for me to create, to be at one with myself and at one with the Divine Spirit, which inspires me. Silence is the one I experienced when I was beaten up in this tent by the racist gang and left lying for dead in a pool of blood. When, in the middle of the night, when I woke up, everything seemed so silent. And then, the trauma, the trauma of feeling fear, not being able to live in the city which I loved. So I gave up my job and went to spend my time with my mother. I was silent. I couldn't say anything to her. Then I went round to the temples of the goddesses and to the goddess whom I prayed before I went to England. And there I spent four weeks just praying to the goddess. What is happening to this world? Why this violence, misunderstanding? I can't understand it. Then, one night, I'd, I saw a glow appearing in my dream. And that glow, red orange glow, telling me, Profula, you have got your two hands. You can create a beautiful world using your hands. Use them. Make this world beautiful with your paintings. So, I woke up. I looked at my hands. I've been creating with my hands. Then I came home and painted. And the painting Kalika, which is in the museum, that's the painting which I did in the village after my visit to the temple. So I'm dedicating that Kalika to the memory of all women in the world, the feminine energy, the goddess, to protect us to help us to grow, grow and make this world a beautiful place using our own hands, our own mind to create
create a beautiful England, a beautiful world. And this beauty is in me and in you, in everybody. That beauty is silent. Thank you for, for, for sharing us with, with us the story about your, your sister, or the, the news about your sister. Um, and thank you also for setting out your approach to, to life and to Tantra. I remember having done studio visits with you and it, it is, is uh, very striking how profoundly Tantra defines your life and, and way of being. And I have learned a lot from you. So, so thank you for sharing that now with everybody here uh, in this space at this. I wondered just quickly, if possible, you could talk a bit about the, the role of silence in your in your work uh, in the in the film it comes through very strongly in the way that you're using your your hands um, is that something you could speak to silence the role of silence the silence speaks the volume silence has got music in it silence has no noise it's peaceful. So the inner peace which silence gives me, and the inner peace which my paintings, I hope, gives to people. And the consciousness, I'm conscious of the world outside me. I'm aware of people around me, aware of the nature around me. Out of sound, color, the sunsets, the sunrises, the beautiful moonlit nights, this beautiful world. We all should live together. And that's what Tantra helps to understand. Then we can all share, like these two hands. These two hands, these two hands help me understand that there is both male and female in me and in all of us. Well, either this or that, no, we're all together, male and female living together in my whole body. And that is what helps me understand that we can all live together in peace and make this world a beautiful place. Thank you. But you've given us an enormous amount in a short space of time. So thank you very much. And I'm going to move on to our next speaker, if that's okay. So um, we'll, we'll leap you back in at the end when we have the questions from the audience. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some, some for you or for, for everybody in that time. So uh, I'm gonna move on now to um, Penny Slinger, who is with us today from California, I think Los Angeles, is that correct? That's correct, yes, I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah, so just earlier we were talking about, you know, the marvels of this technology and us all able to be together right now. So, so um, uh, yes, good morning. And good morning. Uh, Penny Slinger, as you can probably hear from her voice, was born in London and now lives and works in California. She's known for her feminist response to surrealism, as well as her part in the reimagination of Tantra in Europe and the USA. And... And uh, as with Profula, you have some material to, sh to share with us, Penny, a couple of images. Yes, thank you. Um, I know that uh, we decided to show something that would uh, be the inspiration, which was the starting point that then my work was created from. So we're waiting to see that, but I can talk about it until the image comes up. And 
my first encounter really with Tantra was uh, from the Hayward exhibition in 1971, which was the first major Tantric exhibition in England. And when I went to that exhibition, I felt as if I'd come home. I had been studying surrealism before and found my roots as an artist in surrealism. But when I went to the Hayward Gallery, I found what I knew to be the next stage in the evolution, not only of my art, but of my whole being as a spiritual embodied being. And um, walking around the exhibition, I saw so much that resonated with all the imagery I'd seen in surrealism and yet took it to a whole nother level. And it was a language that included everything really and wove it together as is the meaning of Tantra to weave and to expand and brought together um, so much iconography that I was familiar with. And yet now it was putting it in a context that wasn't just to do with the subconscious as surrealism had been delving into and exploring, but with what one could say is the, the super consciousness, that, that next level, that which connects the um, individual with the divine or with higher states and frequencies. I'm hoping we're going to see the image, but if not, I can explain it. Are you seeing it from your end? Uh, uh, we can, I can see it. it. I think we can see it. Oh, OK. I haven't seen it at all. So <laughs> I was um, talking as if we weren't seeing it. So this first image um, shows... Uh, chakra men, um, where you have the image of the body with all the glyphs of the chakras and the deities, the energies that live within this tantric body. And for myself, uh, I was so interested in the body as a vehicle of expression. The body is us, so it's our closest thing. And seeing how these diagrams and representations were made in Tantra was such an inspiration to me because it showed the body as the home of something so much more than itself, of energies, of deities, of all these things. So I took that as my inspiration and created a series of works in the 1970s using my own body and that of my partner, Nick Douglas, um, taking ourselves, and I don't know if we can bring the next slide up, but um, there you can see my interpretation of chakra men and women. And so I put my body and his body onto the Xerox copy machine and in sections made this whole life-size representation of the body. And then using techniques of collage, which I developed in my study of surrealism, putting all these different glyphs in the different energy centers to uh, express and explore my version of and vision of what it meant to be this tantric body and to have all these energies housed within it as portals, if you like, into other realms of experience so that one's not just looking at the material or the physical, but through the physical into what we as physical embodied beings can experience of other states and vibrations and connection to the divine and to all that is. Fantastic. Yes. And uh, I wish I could see these images a bit more closely. I mean, I I, I have uh, this, this second in the exhibition. Um, uh, I have so many questions for you, but I'm going to limit it to, to uh, a few. It's so fantastic to hear you talk about the the exhibition at the Hayward firsthand, because um, there's so little that's actually documented of that. I, I heard that the Hayward have, in fact, not really got even any pictures of it anymore that that uh, that those records have been lost so we really do depend on on oral histories to know about that exhibition mm. um obviously there's the catalogue but it's it's so fantastic to hear you talk about it um i wondered if you could talk about the 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 question of gender a bit in tantra because uh, certainly in terms of the more contemporary work that is made about and re in response to Tantra, um, it's still not as represented in this panel, but it does still tend to be quite male dominated. And I wondered if you could talk about 
your your approach to to gender uh, and tantra in your work? Well, since I really came out as an artist, I was exploring the nature of the feminine because I felt that it was a big gap in the whole history of art. The female is there so strongly, but mainly as an object, not a subject. And so I was very interested in trying to lift those veils and show the inner workings of the feminine psyche. And when I came to Tantra and started to delve deeply into it and understand it, what was one of the things that struck me so powerfully and profoundly was Shakti, the idea of this feminine force, which is a power and energy, not just some receptive idea of the feminine as a receptacle for other energies, but something which was really powerfully procreative, not just in the sense of bringing children into the world, but in actually channeling this amazing energy of all creation, really. And also the idea of Kundalini being the inner goddess, the goddess that lives within everyone, men and women alike, but seen as feminine and seen as this inner goddess that we all have and that we can awaken her and let her pass through and charge our whole being to then ascend as the you know the whole glyphs of the chakras and the ascent of kundalini show her coming up through these different chakras illuminating them invigorating them and then finally coming into the head to unite shiva and shakti in the crown in the head chakra saying that we are uh, much more than just a single gender. We are these male and female androgynous beings. And to me, every act of creation is like the male and female within coming together, making love. And then from their union, this nectar showers down and pours into the cup of the heart, which is the seat of wisdom. And all of this is a very feminine way of looking at things. And so for me, Tantra absolutely embodied because I think the feminine is about embodiment, embodied spirituality, not about some kind of God up in the sky, but about it being absolute spiritual juice and essence that's pouring through all of us. And that Tantra gives us way to connect and to expand into our fully multidimensional selves. And the feminine is given pride of place. She is the initiatress and every male god form too in Tantra has his, his complementary shakti, his complementary female aspect. So all of this was integrated in such a way that was just for me absolutely um, what I was looking for as the way of lifting all this ignorance and guilt and shame and around all of this embodied spirituality which the goddess brings to us. And the goddess of Tantra to me is the most liberating force that we can connect with and align with in our lives as women and as human beings. Wow, that's an incredibly inspiring summation of quite a number of different parts of the, the history and the material that we're talking about today. Um, have you been able to see the, were you able to see the exhibition in London? I'm assuming maybe just virtually. I have only seen it virtually and I've um, seen the catalogue, which is wonderful. And for me, of course, this is just a dream come true that we're actually bringing Tantra forward again, because after that exhibition ignited so much in me and changed my whole life um, to be able to see this now coming back, because a lot of the art that I've produced in a tantric vein, I felt didn't really have an audience yet. And there was still not an understanding of Tantra because unfortunately, or it's just how it is, um, the modern day men and women picked up on the essential aspect and focused so much on that, that they forgot to see that this is an all inclusive spiritual path, which unites everything and allows you to make everything you do in your life and your work, part of your spiritual sadhana, your practice. And so, this is such a path, such an absolutely um, sovereign path, I think, for everyone. And I would love to see Tantra being understood 
but as it already dissolves all um, separations between uh, caste and creed, between all nations and all people, and to be this shining path that we can all take, which has all the benefits of spirituality with none of the uh, trappings of religion, which is often being much more confining than liberating. So to me, it is really the path of liberation, and I'm so happy to see it presented here. And for me, my entrance was the art, and so the art speaks and communicates so much of the essence of Tantra, and uh, what a delight to have this done, and so well, I'm, I'm so so pleased to be part of it. Mm, yeah, fantastic, and it is, it is so um, timely to have this material presented in the in the way that Emma has, has framed it for this particular exhibition yes. in terms of the the radicalism and the emphasis on the on the feminine so absolutely yeah, uh, yes yeah. wonderful job we agree on that <laughs> <laughs> and much more i'm sure okay um this is all seeming far too pacey and um you know we could go in so many different directions yes. and one day we will and maybe in real life um uh, for now, I'm going to move over to talk to Barty in Delhi, quite some time away in an, another time zone. Um, so thank you very much, Penny, and we'll come back to you, thank uh, you. At, at the end. Thank you. So Barty um, was also born in London, studied here in, in the UK, and then has lived in India since 1993, where she continues to, to live and work now, although you've just been away for a, a year or, or so, you were just saying. Um, and really, Bharti is known for her ability to transform the everyday and has a long, long history working with Tantra and Tantric motifs. So Bharti is going to spoil us with lots of images right now, um, beginning with, uh, with this one of Chinamasta. Is that right? Bharti, I think you're muted. No, so I just thought I'd show you some um, images um, I the, the work that I'm showing at the British Museum um, and all the while the benevolent slept really came from um, just l discovering this image um, in, in a book and I was completely almost devastated by the power of the image and the idea of the what the jinnah must have actually represented and I've been casting for many years and I've been casting the female figure for many years. And casting is a very integral part of my practice in the sense that I try to capture the essence and the, the essence of the body through the casting. Uh, most of my castings are my friends or, or other women that I know. Um, and what I was really looking at when I was doing body casts of, of, of people that I know and to sort of create them into these sort of fantastical hybrid, um, what I called urban goddesses, was a sense of both reality and something that was metaphysical. And when I saw this image, what I was really interested in was how, and what I started to read about Tantra, um, was how Tantra became an emergence of a kind of shamanic goddesses. Um, they were worshipped as a reaction towards, um, against a kind of masculine Vedic tradition of which was hierarchical. Um, it was about the priesthood, um, the caste system, the caste system, and essentially, these goddesses were subversive, and they, um, you know, what what I liked about this is that I mean, as an artist, I think. Um, poetry, psychology, um, religion, the theological and the metaphysical parts of religion are the, my sort of favorite parts of, of storytelling. And, and as an artist, I'm a storyteller. Um, I make images that are that you or I have not necessarily experienced or seen. And what I was interested in is how Dantra is also an oral tradition that's been passed down from, say, guru to student. And so this idea of the whisper, um, of things being passed down through speech, through magic, through realism, um, it also creates an energy that's passed on like poetry. Um, and so this energy is a form of consciousness. And so when I make the female figures, um, what I'm trying to do is to encapsulate um, 
a duality of both the masculine and the feminine. Um, the hybrid form is something that I've been looking at for so many years. And I, and I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily someone who's um, very specifically looking at Tantra, but somehow Tantra and I came together. In, 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 in some ways, I was quite surprised how unoriginal I actually was, because here was a millennia year, um, was, a, was a theology of, of over a, a thousand years that had been talking about and had been looking about this idea of the liminal form. And so when I started making um, things like, you'll see the images of the, say, the two hybrid women, um, this was a series of works that I did in 2003 after I had had my first child. And, and I was looking at this idea of in-betweenness, um, how your body can transcend both structure, both anthropologically as well as physically, how as a woman I could carry a son. Um, so you'll see these two pictures here, the left and right. So chocolate muffin and on the right is um, one of the other hybrid women's where where I was morphing together both the animal, the animalistic, the shamanistic quality of the female form, as well as the physicality of, um, of, of say, women that I knew who I found to be very strong and powerful. Um, I like the idea that these women could be mediators, they could be talisman, um, they could travel in some ways. Um, you'll see in the images, there are no shadows in the works. Um, because they're of no place. Um, it's very specific that these women are of no time. Um, they transcend both uh, cultural and physical and ethical, no, sorry, no, ethnic, um, not ethical, ethnic. They just, and they don't have a space and they don't have necessarily a place. Um, and they sort of exist between this world and another world. Um, so I think I've what over many years in my work I've been dipping into this idea and moving in and out of this idea of duality and of things that appear as one but actually are and have the potential to be an other. Um, so I, I think sometimes this idea of inside and outside, um, how the inside of perhaps a figure, especially say when I cast, um, I like the idea that when I, I like the idea that when I cast a, you or, or somebody that I know, that at some point the plaster, when it's hot, when it's warm, somehow opens the pores of your skin. And now I capture your essence. And there is something about you that then I capture into my work, which is somehow true. Um, it's a kind of vibration. And this is also part of Tantra. Tantra believes that all organic things, we being of course organic, we vibrate, we hum, we pulse, and we also dance. And, you know, this idea that both the masculine and the feminine is a kind of dance within the body itself. In fact, the, that everything that you feel yourself within your body is the dance of the masculine and the feminine, Shiva and Shakti. And, you know, these kind of philosophies are just in some ways, um, these theologies, the, both, the, the, the idea of the metaphysical, the things that you can't quite describe. It's, I mean, art somehow is a, is, a, is, a, is a parallel. We walk together, we walk side by side because in our, art in a way too is a, is a, is a leap of faith. Um, we are trying to describe the, an, the intangibles um, mm -hmm. things that we simply can't know. Um, and I think that in, in my practice, in my own work, it's also always something that I'm looking to do or I'm looking or I'm searching for um, is this idea of arrival and departure, ascension and dissension. Um, it's the story of duality, um, energy and consciousness, masculine and feminine. And I do it in the works that I make both with sculpture and with um, the Bindi works that I make, which are the two dimensional pieces. And so in some ways I'm both um, um, a, a highly figurative sculptor and an artist, but within my studio practice on 2D in two dimension, I'm strictly 
abstract. And so there are in in my in my studio there are almost two languages happening at the same time. Hmm. And um, uh, I, 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 I've, the, the question, that, or many questions that I would like to ask you, but the question I really wanted to ask you today was about um, two dimensionality and, and three dimensionality, and the 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 picture of Chinamasta that we had at the at the beginning. What does that mean to 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 then render that in three dimensions? which is the, the piece that you have in, in the exhibition and the benevolent slept. And all the while the benevolent slept. I think um, what I wanted to do was to bring that work into the 20th century. And mm. I wanted to um, give her um, and the body access again um, to slightly um, bastardize it in a way as well. Um, the idea is to bring the idea of the of the, the skull that now is not her own skull, but is the skull of Lucy. Um, uh, you know, um, what is it? One point three million years ago, um, the first uh, now now superseded by other um, anthropological finds, but um, superseded. Um, she was the first hominoid in some ways, and while. While Shakti is um, sort of saving the world, she's sort of having a cup of tea because it's all in a day's work. And um, she, I wanted, I, I just thought the image itself was just so extraordinarily powerful. Um, and materiality is also um, is really important. How would I, how would I describe the the flowing of her blood? This idea of the elixir, the nectar. Um, that sustains and um, sustains but also um, nourishes earth again. So mm. then I use something like copper, um, which it was highly polished and, you know, finely, finely tuned down to a very sharp spike so that you get the sense of danger of the blood, of her blood. Um, because Gali, in essence, is, is she represents, for me, she's the keeper of time. And time is dangerous. And mm. she is both the creator of, obviously, and we all know that she's both the creator and the destroyer. Um, but she's eternal in some ways and always in union. So there's, I mean, for me, this idea of, tantra of, the, of duality, of contradiction, is something that knocks back and forth in my work all the time. Mm. Um, and so... It just we're, it's it's a happy marriage. Mm, yeah, no, that's fantastic to hear you talk about it. Uh, uh, that that one example in the exhibition, how that speaks to so many other parts of your of your practice. So thank you for um, sharing so many images and and so much insight. And in so, again, in such a short amount of time, um, we'll come back to you in the questions at the end. And for now, we're going to move to Shutapa uh, Biswas. So um, Shutapa was born in Shantinikaitan, West Bengal, and moved to England at the age of four. She has a long and distinguished career of working in the UK and internationally, often focusing on questions of gender and identity, uh, as, as so many of us here today, and is currently a reader in fine art at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, so we have some images of your work housewives with steak knives but we're not starting with that we're starting with this one which is uh, something from in the exhibition yeah um i mean i think the the object has been to really of today is really been to contextualize the work that's currently in the tantra exhibition um titled housewives with steak knives. And in many senses, I'd say that for me, it was one of the, it was one of two really early, fairly major works that seems to have a life of its own. <laughs> it was made between 1983 and 1985. Um, and made at a time during my um, undergraduate uh, study at the University of Leeds, where I was studying fine art and art history. Um, 
in a department that had actually been established by the renowned art historian uh, T.J. Clark, and um, where many uh, wonderful uh, art historians and tutors uh, we were exposed to their their teaching, in, including uh, Griselda Pollock, who recently won the Holberg Prize. Um, but one of the things that I experienced as an undergraduate student was um, the Eurocentric nature of art history as a discipline, which for me was really problematic because apart from the fact that I think really is Penny, I think um, you highlighted earlier that there was really an absence or an absence of um, engaging with uh, questions of femininity and um, the female subject, if you like, within the broader realm of art history. And certainly I would say that that extended to a lack of discourse around questions of um, representation outside of the global north. And so it was quite tough sitting in, you know, art history lectures at the time and feeling a real sense of absence in terms of, you know, the kinds of questions that were very relevant for me. And so I began to really, if you like, mine iconography and subject matter that was relevant to me and to the kinds of imagery and narratives that I'd been raised with as a child, albeit in a British context, through pujo, through um, effigies, through small sculptures, through, yeah, just various narratives, um, Pujo, as I think I've said, in my own sort of domestic life growing up in the UK, through my parents and through our extended um, circle of, of friends and, and relatives. And for me, it was very evident that the kinds of iconography that I had grown up with that included images of Kali um, and for me were very transgressive, were certainly the things that defined my sense of self and yet weren't represented or evident within the sort of broader mainstream culture of that time. And so I began to really explore, um, you know, the possibilities of merging um, mythological figures and narratives that fell outside of a Eurocentric domain, if you like, um, with iconography that first of all had um, a relevance to me in terms of my personal history, but also in terms of what had been very inspiring and a very important force, feminine and transgressive force in my own life growing up. Um, and Carly, in many senses, um, was an iconographic figure and image um, that was so transgressive in terms of our uh, preconceptions within a Euro Eurocentric sort of dominant uh, context of notions of beauty and aesthetic and, um, you know, questions of around power. And, you know, there was a particular kind of force to her as as an image, as an icon, that seemed a perfect way for me to then, if we can move to the Housewives with Steak Knives image, please, um, that was a way for me to bring together and really situate that within the center 
frame of this of this work, Housewives with Steak Knives. And rather than to situate her within a kind of um, religious context, my interest was to remove her from that in, in many senses by naming her as a housewife um, and by identifying the things that she's carrying or making that um, analogy, if you, if you will, with domestic in implements and a domestic kind of context. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna have to, I've had a very bad throat today, so. Could I have the next slide, please? And at the same time, I was very, I found it very important to um, think about questions of aesthetics and formal representations of women as a subject. And this again is something that Penny, I think very interestingly raised in, in her presentation. How do we move from the objectification to placing, um, you know, the woman, if you like, as, as central to our subject. And I began to look at other points of reference. Could I have the next, well, before I go to the next slide, maybe I could just highlight that what you see here is a detail of Housewives with Steak Knives. And within that detail, you see a small black flag that she's holding alongside an, Im an image or representation of a rose actually. And within that flag is collaged two um, paintings, a represent or a kind of reproduction of two paintings. May I have the next slide please? And in both of those images are works painted by the um, Italian artists, Artemisia Gentileschi. This is um, an image of Judith beheading Holofernes that was painted in um, uh, circa 1613. And I, as an artist at the time or making work at the time, I was very interested in bringing together narratives that sh were shared across different cultures. And that again, created a space in which women were empowered and, and, and placed at the center of, um, of subject. Uh, if we can move to the final image, please. And as you can see, um, this is an installation shot of Housewives with Steak Knives that was taken at the at Tate Britain in where it was shown in 2012. But you can see more clearly from this image that the top half of the painting sits forward of the rear wall um, on, upon which it's mounted by approximately 18 inches um, to 20 inches. And so what positioning this, this work for me does additionally is to really activate um, the context of the imagery that we see within it. And to really, I hope, um, draw parallels between, uh, between narratives across time and across different histories. Um, I was, of course, as a student of art history and fine art, very much immersed with questions of modernism and representations of form. So in many senses, the, the space, the white upon which um, this central figure in Housewives with Steak Knives is presented is suspended, if you like, or emerges quite forcefully out of this white background, which actually is a reference to Rauschenberg's series of white paintings. And so I, as a practitioner, as an artist, was engaging, I think, with questions of representations within art history, but trying to disrupt uh, the canon, if you like, and what existed within mainstream representations 
by really drawing forces from across time and space. And Carly um, is actually in my, my painting, or the it's a it's a kind of self representation, if you like, self portrait. And if we maybe could go back to the first image, if we've got time, um, you'll see, that, sorry, the second image, you'll see that um, her tunic um, that she's wearing here is um, kind of a design that looks like Ikat. But in actual fact, it's based on a, um, a little blouse, a tunic that I bought from, you know, Miss Selfridges or something. Um, in fact, I still have it. But if you have a look at the detail within the imagery and how the, the design is, is, exists in relation to the way in which the eyes in, within the figure that's drawn here are echoed in, um, in terms of the pattern that you see it within the tunic. So there are various kinds of optical spaces that, and portals that for me were very important to trying to encourage the viewer to enter into that space, but also to undermine its associations with religion per se, but rather to think about the feminine force and the absolute power of that. And you'll, you'll recall from the final image that we saw, in terms of bringing that painting, this painting forward off the wall, it was really a way for me to create a very unsettling sense of what this subject is. Mm. And to almost move out of the, the, the containment of the frame that's presented here. So um, I hope in, in brief that that perhaps sums something, um, something up. Of course, one can always talk about a piece of work for a very long time. And I guess, but you know, we are limited to here. So um, yeah, I discovered some years after returning to India in 1986, 87, um, which was the first time I return, had returned to India since coming to the UK, that in actual fact, my uh, adoptive grandmother on my father's side, who was widowed very soon after her marriage, um, had been, was very well known as a devotee of, of Carly. So in a way, she was a kind of prototype feminist. And, uh, I, and this was something I didn't know. Um, until certainly when I made Housewives with Steak Knives and didn't know until I returned to India and saw a, a small print that she had left for me, um, you, you know, to, to receive when eventually I returned to India. So it mm. sort of opens up a whole other series of questions in relation to the subconscious and what is retained and the transformative yeah. power of, of imagery and iconography and narrative and the relationships that we form between ourselves and those people whom we love. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you ever so much. I, I had a whole list of questions, but uh, we're not going to get to going to get to them, unfortunately, because there's lots coming from the audience and I want to be sure to give them some time. Um, So um, just to kind of for my part to sum up, uh, as I said, I mean, you know, when we heard from Penny talking about the Hayward exhibition, this one of the things that interests me in, in, in Tantra and Tantric art is that there, there is no full written history. Um, and it is only by talking with artists that, that we learn about it. So um, thank you ever so much. It's really an example where artistic and curatorial practice is, a, is ahead of academic scholarship, I think. And we definitely need to spend more time learning, thinking about uh, the role that Tantra has played in, in shaping our world and, and can help shape it, shape it further. Um, in terms of questions that have been coming in from, from the audience, um, there is one from a guy who says, I am a gay man who follows Neo-Tantra 
Um, and would the panelists see tantric art as confirming or challenging ideas of binary and heteronormative views of other spiritualities? I don't know who might like to answer that question. I feel Penny, maybe you touched on it a bit when you were, were speaking. Yes, uh, I think that we have been so put into boxes uh, based on our sexual identity. And it's definitely a time when all of that is being shaken up. And Tantra gives us such a wonderful vehicle to explore that from a different perspective. And one where I say the natural androgyny of the being and the fact that we do house male and female energies within ourselves, whichever way we actually come out as uh, with a penis or a vagina. Um, and also the idea of the deification and sanctification of the lingam and the yoni, these being seen as sacred objects of worship has so far from all the guilt and shame that has been associated with sexuality. I don't say how one can for an instant think that um, there's something sinful about this divine sport, which is celebrated as the play of the gods and goddesses in Tantra. And we're allowed to commune with that in a way which goes beyond stereotypes, where we can find these energies and as I was saying before, the awakening of the feminine, I think, is absolutely key to our times in terms of how we look at things. And even putting a name of whether it's masculine or feminine is limiting in some sense, but it's just those qualities that we maybe associate with the feminine. But that awakening of the feminine is not just for women. It's for that feminine side of all of our natures to be put in pride of place now so that she can start to exercise the kind of compassion and the wisdom of the heart and the way of seeing a different sense of what power is and the dynamic, the play between male and female. Let's take it away from just what your gender is and let's start to allow those energies to play in our very beings ourselves so that then we become much more malleable and permeable and, and liquid and fluid in our approach to all of this. So I would say that any of the other persuasions, other practices, other religions have often had dogmas around all these things. What I love about Tantra is it is not dogmatic. It is not sectarian. And it just takes off all this nonsense and allows us to actually see how energy works. And energy works in the play of Shiva and Shakti, male and female. And that play is in everything. So I think this is what we need to embrace and start to see ourselves beyond the stereotype of men and women, but actually as beings and not just human beings, but multidimensional beings. So that includes all of this that we're talking about being much more part of all of us. And uh, that's what I would offer to this question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Penny. Um, there's a question specifically for Barty, which says, uh, you mentioned that you made all uh, and all while the benevolent sleep after childbirth. Um, did Chilamasa take on new meanings for you postpartum? And if so, how? Um, there was a whole series of works I made. Actually, I was, I was referring to the, phot the photographs, the hybrid series that I made in 2004. Um, I gave birth to my daughter in 2003. And at, while I was pregnant, I was making a whole series of photographs. But also, very shortly after, I started doing the first castings. And I think um, it did. It, it, I, I changed exponentially after I had children. Um, and I... Was I was able to tune into my body in a way that um, I hadn't actually thought possible before. Um, I, it's a strange thing because when I had my son, I knew, although in India you're not allowed to have um, um, tests of, of what your what, what your child is, but I knew that I was having a son, and I would make drawings, and I'd say this is this is the only time in my life perhaps that I'm going to be both a man and a woman at the same time. And in some ways it kind of was, <laughs> I, I became um, masculine and feminine 
in physicality. And I started to look at the image of the Adara Vishwana, which is the half man and half woman, which is um, Penny. In, in terms of Tantra, um, we have, it is such a rich visual language of, of um, thresholds. Um, tantra is really mm. about all, it's somehow kind of, it's always the harbinger of change. Um, everything is about, about between stages of being, not being, the inside is as important as the outside, fragmentation, disjointedness, um, everything that challenges your ideas of what the whole being is somehow, is it composite, how is it unified? There's lots of jagged edges in Dantra, in the imagery as well, in the terms of it's not smooth. And for me, that's what I was really interested in. And um, going back to the question, yes, I mean, after I had children, it changed the way that I made work as a woman. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Prafula, could I, uh, if I, if I could ask you a, a, a difficult question um, for you to maybe um, answer as, as succinctly as you can. Um, and, and the question is, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on consciousness? What is it? Consciousness is the understanding of the self. Consciousness is the understanding of the universe around you. Consciousness is the understanding of the world. The world is in your body. Consciousness of the music, the dance of nature. Consciousness of your existence, my friend's existence, the world's existence, that all those images are inside my body. That's what creates my consciousness of the whole world. World of friends, world of nature, world of flowers, world of birds, the blue skies, the golden sun, the beautiful moon, me, Standing on the paddy field, with the sky above, and free to dance to become a part of the universe. That Thank you, Perfula. Thank you, Perfula. Is that okay? That's brilliant. Very good. <laughs> done brilliantly. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a difficult question that you've answered um, spontaneously. Thank you. And um, one last question for, for you, Shutapa, which is um, what you made the, the work that's in the show some, some time ago, um, I think around 35 years, yet it seems to have incredible contemporary relevance. Um, looking at it, you know, especially the, the, the time that we've just had, you know, it, it makes me think of so many things. The Gentileschi show was on at the National Gallery down the road at the same time. Um, and Black Lives Matter. And I just wondered for you as a, as a personal experience, what is that like to, to, to see and, and be with that work again in this time? It's very exciting uh, to, um, and great, you know, privilege and honor to have Housewives with Steak Knives shown at the British Museum. I think it's always been an ambition of mine that one day it would be shown there. So it's been it's been very important to return to this museum, which represents so much about the history of um, imperialism, and for something that you were makes that in many senses, engages with those kinds of questions, um, you know, uh, and tr has tried to unpick it, to, to reframe it. It's an incredibly, it is an androgynous work. It's a very powerful work. Um, you know, it's got legs, it just keeps running and running. And I think the fact that it still has this agency right now, 
you know, 35 years after it was made is, you know, it's, um, it's a travesty that we still live in a world where, you know, there are, there are such gross inequalities and where imperialism is, is still rife. Um, I think it's been inspiring as a work to many people across the generations and decades. Um, and it's been sustaining in, for me on a personal level, you know, coming back to see it whenever I see it, I feel as if I'm visiting a friend. Um, and at different points in its history, when it's been exhibited, when it was exhibited in as part of Thin Black Lines in 1985-86, when the artist Lebena Himid curated that particular exhibition, um, unfortunately, it was spat at right between the eyes, one spit mark right between the eyes. And it's hard to think that you know, whoever did that was so incensed. First of all, they, they, they must have been practicing that there was only one spit mark. But it says something about the violence of that act, but also that this work had the capability of um, creating such a, an extraordinary response is also something very important to note mm. at that time in history we have to remember that you know there was there was a very strong uh uh movement you know uh against um national front movement if you like um uh, under thatcher's government mm. um, and yet at the same time you know there there were some amazing things happening within the arts, within the culture, within culture, different cultural fields that really challenge those kinds of preconceptions and stereotypes and racist kinds of formations. So this work was very important. And then interestingly, when it was, it traveled in, was again shown in 2008 or nine, I forget exactly, um, in a show that was curated by Louise Yellen. Uh, um, in in New York. Um, yes, and there was a controversial reception there as well, wasn't there? Yeah, by right. the yeah, Hindu backlash. Yeah. The, the Hindu Vata, you know, uh, fascists as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, you know, you have these extreme kinds of responses that I think were very much about trying to control um, women mm. and uh, women's voices. Yeah. Um, you know, there was an argument made by somebody who objected it, to it being shown at this, at Louise's um, exhibition that, you know, she couldn't possibly be a Hindu icon because Hindus don't eat steak, you know. Well... <laughs> But that's a whole other thing we could go into. I think um, what's really interesting to hear you talk about is um, how it's cyclical. And in the same way we've been talking about the reception of Tantra, you know, can kind of come back and, and teach us different things at different times. And, and yeah. this has come, this exhibition has come at a time, you know, when we can see it in the, in, in the light of um, COVID and, and Black Lives Matters and what's been happening in America and... Um, so so much to learn on, on so many different different levels not to mention also the, the spiritual so um, I'm gonna wrap it up more more fully now and say thank you ever so much to everybody to um, Bharti Care to Shapata uh, Shatapa Baswas to uh, Penny Slinger to Prafula Mahanti so I'm gonna say goodbye and I'm gonna say Thank you to, to everyone here. Thank you to everybody who's um, been with us today watching. There were a, a huge number of people that, that signed up and wanted to engage with this talk and the discussion. So thank you to all of you. And thank you to Emma Ramos and 
um, Freddie Williams, uh, Freddie Matthews even, <laughs> sorry, uh, for inviting me to do this talk, uh, to chair this talk. It's been a, a great privilege. So thank you very much. Thank Good you. afternoon and bye-bye for now. Thank, thank you. you.